So what we were talking about was <clears throat> the different levels of uh, closeness to meat. Right. So if you think about it, like the, in terms of proximity, but also in terms of meaningfulness, well, me, proximity, meaningfulness, and then like the levels of removeness. I don't know how to say that word, like the levels that you're removed from the levels of separation, separation. There you go. The levels of separation from the food that you consume. Yeah. Right. So when I think about that, we're, so we were talking about, uh, kind of rifle hunting. So, so I've been rifle hunting for, I don't know what five or six years. Cause you and your dad took me out the first time, probably six years ago, seven years ago to dove hunt at, at Bonham. Super casual. Right. Yeah. Like I never hunted anything. It was kind of, I was into guns, but I never hunted. And then probably two years after that, we went to Sid and I shot that little buck and then I was hooked. Right. Yeah. And then since then, uh, during COVID you're like, dude, get a bow. Right. And of course me being the guy that I am, I'm like, well, <clears throat> I got to go get a Matthews bow because yeah. they're more expensive than everything else. <laughs> well, because at first you were like, yeah, if I'm going to do this, I want some guarantee of effectiveness. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. that's why you were, I think, hesitant to embrace that whole world. And then you're like, okay, I can understand the challenge, the idea of bow hunting, but you're like, I'd rather risk overpaying. Oh, for sure. Dude, than, than I've not been burned, having the best gear. I've been I burned guess. so many times by like, oh, well, hey, this one's a hundred. I'll get the one for sixty, and then I have to buy two of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> right? dude, you're you're speaking right to me because like I've had so much discount gear. I worked for a discount gear manufacturer. There were there straight up are things where for sure. the name brand is overpaying for something. Yeah, but there are a lot of things where. Yeah, you should probably go with the name brand, like go with the real deal. But it, ultimately, it depends on like, is this something you're dabbling in and just messing around with it? Yeah. Something that's just kind of fun and cutesy to you and you just want to try it? Then yeah, get a cheap item. But it is interesting because like when I started in hunting, and this is way off of what we were originally talking about, <laughs> but but it's good because when I started in hunting, it was like, hey, I'm going to go to Bass Pro Shop or Academy and I'm going to buy like the the $10 camo shirt that's cotton and that I didn't realize when I go out in the field and it gets a little warm, it's going to soak right through. And my smell's going everywhere. Uh, I bought all that stuff, right? And then probably two years in, I'm like, man, I'm going to buy some Sitka because uh, I'm going to spend on a on a shirt, like a hoodie shirt, lightweight shirt. It's like $120. But that is going to last me for a really long time. And by the way, what I noticed when I started bow hunting is it's 10 times quieter yeah. than anything else out there, right? Um, so it, it, it's that investment, but so anyway, so, so well, I, I'll, on that, while, okay, while right. we're on that, I mean, I, I feel like that's so, if you were to look at my really early, super cringy videos on my channel and please don't, they're horrible. It's <laughs> like, all real tree. Yeah. I, I was wearing Academy <laughs> mm -hmm. real tree brand stuff. Cause I'm like, ah, I, you know, this works and I save money and I can do it. And it's so tempting. It is so tempting for people who are like, yeah, I want to do this and I'm on a budget. But in a way, it's a, it's a bit of a trap because you end up having to buy the next level of gear, of gear and then gear up. And it's like a video game where you're just like, oh, I hope I get to the next level. Yeah, yeah. And so, you're just trying to gear up every time. And my first scope review was a Monstrum Tactical 3 to 9. It was a Monstrum uh, An Amazon Chinese <laughs> piece of shit. And no name like that was my first scope review. I'm talking like my YouTube video. Twenty nine ninety nine, probably <laughs> probably like eighty nine, but still, it it's was amazing. like three to nine mil dot, like all this stuff. It's that, better than a Weaver. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. But so, it, so it, but I did all that, and now I've come to the point where it's just like, what do I have on my hunting rifle? Yeah, it's a Night Force. Yeah. And my why'd you buy that Night Force, by the way? <laughs> uh, lots of reasons, yeah. but, um, did I have one on mine first? Barely fear of missing out a little bit. No, <laughs> I had shot. By a the night, way, I had shot a night. I had oh, shot sure. a night. You force shot one before me before 100%. you owned a night force, but they are amazing. They and are it was good. an NXS, the real night force, not either yeah. of the ones that either. Well, of us well but they also weigh about two pounds more. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, all right. So I don't think I've ever admitted this. I don't know if you ever know this. 
I'm going to admit it on the podcast. So hopefully this doesn't get, you know, pushed out there. Here we go on the record. So my first time going hunting with you and your dad at Sid, right? Uh, it was, so they, Sid was basically this, this ranch is like 2,500 acres. They had like 20 spots. They didn't have feeders. They just kind of threw out corn and it was kind of, Hey, you're in the spot. If you see something, put it down. If you don't, don't. Right. Um, and it's an old boy scout camp. It's a cool spot. It, it was primarily a fundraiser, but correct. Geography. They, they had, geographically. Yeah. They had good deer out they there. They have good deer out there. Right. So <clears throat> I'm out there and dude, I had never hunted. Right. And I didn't want to look like an asshole. So I'm like, all right, well, I've got like, uh, I know it's going to be windy. So I've got windbreakers and I've got, uh, like long johns and all this stuff. So I put on all these long johns. I put windbreakers over it, dude. I had no real hunting gear. I had like a camel shirt literally that I bought from Academy or Bass Pro or whatever. Dude, I was freezing my ass off. Like I'm sitting up in this tree stand and I was right on one of the peninsulas by the lake. There's a lake out there and the wind was whipping off the lake. And for probably 70% of the time, that first day hunt where your dad shot that big buck. Yeah. When I was sitting by that lake where y'all dropped me off, I'm just sitting there like, teeth chattering like <laughs> this sucks what am i doing and it was funny i think i was facing the wrong direction the whole time because <laughs> i i'm like man i can't believe nothing's coming here but i'm sitting there looking in the wind right but the real shooting lane was the wind was behind me so i'm like well i didn't really have a shot that way anyway and, and at that place the the real shooting lane is where they threw out the corn correct whereas I probably told you, make sure you're phasing into the wind that's at all correct. costs. Cause yeah. that's kind of the level I was on. And I'm like, I'm looking into the wind, but there's about a hundred yards before I see water. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do here. So anyway, coming back to it. So the gear thing is an important thing, right? Uh, and I learned that early on. So that's what caused me to buy a Matthews is I was like, Hey, if I'm going to get into bow hunting, I remember you had bought a crossbow to start and we went out to, um, we went out to Bonham and you let me shoot your crossbow. I'm like, man, this is cool. And then you're like, man, I'm done with crossbow. Like, I'm going bow because it, there's a, it's a different thing. Well, for me, getting into crossbow, uh, I, I had killed several deer, mostly in Mississippi, a little bit in Texas, with a rifle. And I'm like, man, I, I really want to go get into a bow, bow world. Basically, uh, the the mentality of bow hunting, um, just everything about bow hunting. I, I want to get there. So how can I transition from where I am into that? And I'm like, okay, cool. Crossbow is a cool step where I can learn about archery and shooting an arrow and all this stuff. And then I just dabbled around with it. And in hindsight, I wish I had never gone there. Well, but what's cool is like, um, so someone that's learning from some of your experiences and quite frankly, failures, right? And I wouldn't say that's a failure, but learning from that. Dude, no, that's, that's okay. Cause that's like, that's a huge portion of what my content, my experience, my channel is. Yeah. It's just like, I've done a lot of things. I'm the really stubborn type who has to do it and prove it to myself that it either works or doesn't work. And so I hope people can learn from what I've done right or what I've done wrong. But if you remember, you probably don't, but when I was, when, so COVID happens, right. And it kind of changes the world. And so we're all stuck inside. I'm like, man, I'm bored. And I, I live in a, I live in a house that's in the middle of this little town and my L- backyard, little town. Yeah, my backyard's the size of my living room, literally. But I'm like, dude, I think I get about 22 yards out of that. And I'm like, plenty, man, I need to do something. He's like, Hey, you should get into bow hunting and just practice. And I'm like, all right, should I get a crossbow? And I remember you're like, absolutely not. And I said, well, you got one first and then you got into bow hunting did it help you? Like, did, were there any transferable skills? And you're like, there literally were none. Yeah. Because it's, you're pulling a trigger. Uh, it's, it's everything about it's different. You're, you could be further away. It's, everything is different than bow it, hunting. It's short range rifle hunting with an arrow. It, yes. It's like the idea of shooting a slug gun with a red dot sight. Right. You, yeah. You don't have extreme long range capability, but the, the form anchoring the way an arrow flies you don't think about that kind of stuff. Right. Well, and, and the, the interesting thing too is to your point, it's a short, short range rifle shot almost with bow hunting as anyone that's ever bow hunted knows, uh, there's so many variables in it when an animal actually shows up. Right. So you're, you're within, uh, usually 20 to 40 yards of an animal when you take a shot. And in that 20 to 40 yard range, you have to pull back your, your, your arm. I'm right-handed. So I have to, I have to pull the the string back with my right hand with my release 
And that's a motion that I've had a deer run off on me on. Right? Oh, dude, getting busted on the draw is yes, yeah, so 100%. common. With a with a with a, a crossbow, not the case, right? You literally are you're rifle hunting, right? Yeah. So anyway, you take the safety off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fast forward, and you hope that you don't like accidentally put your hand there and the string cuts your hand off, kind of deal. When when you were like, hey, get a bow, don't get a crossbow. I went to uh, what what was that place? Uh, Texas. What is where is what is the place I bought my bow from? Texas Archery Academy. Tex- yeah, Texas Archery. Academy. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Troy's deal. Troy's, yeah. Anyway, uh, All Star Marine and Archery. That's it. All Star Marine Archery, which is now consolidated a little bit. It's still but. the same thing, but they 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 closed the Louisville shop. They have it out in uh, wherever it is now. Yeah. So there's a guy, Troy. Troy's great dude. If uh, anyone's in Texas and Dallas area, go to All Star and go see Troy. He's fantastic. Uh, so I went and saw Troy. He hooked me up. He had me shoot a couple bows. He's like, "Hey, man." Uh, I think this one's probably the right one for you. I'm six, four. So he's like, this is probably a good bow for you. I ended up shooting it, loved it. It was a Matthews, um, took it out the door and literally for six months, I went out back every day and I would shoot 10, 10 shots, right? 15 nice. shots or whatever. Nice. And it was just kind of understanding like, how do I draw? What's the release like? Where am I hitting? And then plenty helped me a lot with just understanding like, how do you manipulate your sight? Um, and it was weird because I do a lot of pistol and rifle shooting, right? And it's kind of inverse of pistol and rifle shooting. Like the bow is going to shoot where the bow is going to shoot. And then you adjust your sight. And I guess you could say the same thing with rifle, but it's just different. Like the the thought process of how you adjust it is different. So we did a lot of that. And then I'm well, like, I was always used to like rifle shooting. When you think about front sight, rear sight, what is it? Four is front, opposite, rear, same. That doesn't work with bows. Right, at all. You, where it bows, it's follow the arrow. Right, follow the arrow. So <clears throat> this was all in, gosh, probably what was this? It probably wasn't six months. I probably lied about two two minutes ago. It was probably a month and a half, two months that I was practicing. And then we went out to Coleman, I think in October. because we So we got drawn for this this Laguna Atacosa hunt, which there's a YouTube video on. Which you were skeptical about even oh, putting in it. super skeptical. Because... And, and I urged you into it and I realized I, I feel like I tricked you a little bit. Oh, you do feel like, <laughs> because I, but in the long term I don't regret it at all because I'm like, well, not yeah. after that awesome mountain on my wall. <laughs> yeah. Later. Daniel just got his note guy back today. <laughs> it's amazing. But, um, looking at it, I'm like, yeah, we had gone on private land and, and hunted with rifles over corn and done all this stuff. But I'm like, yeah, here's this hunt that I applied for once, and I got a shot on this weird creature called a nil guy. I'm like, what the hell is a nil guy? It's like, it's an Indian devil deer. It's this weird walk-in hunt where you, you kind of like got to ride a bicycle, and it's kind of weird, but you should totally do it. And, and that's it, like literally it, it, all I heard. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. And I, n- full, me full of knowing that I'm like, we're signing up for an ass kicking, <laughs> but we're better for it, man. We're better for yeah. it. Yeah. Well, so we we... <clears throat> Before that hunt, I I literally bought my bow, what, four, three or four months before that. Yeah. So clearly it wasn't six months that I was hunting with it and or practicing with it. So I'm like, hey, Plenty, I got to go like try to shoot something with this before I go down and shoot this crazy, you know, 600 pound animal with horns. Yeah. And, devil horse. Yeah, devil horse. So we go down to Coleman, or I guess we go out west to Coleman and I end up shooting this big old fat sow. The greaser. The greaser. Dude, <laughs> holy smokes, man. I still, so I shot the sow. She ran, I, I had a, it was a high lung shot, double lung, high shot though. She ran probably 120 yards, found her on this little hill. We found her, pulled her out. She was dead. We should have rendered the lard from that thing because I did it on a big boar afterwards and it was totally worth it. And was I it? think about how crazy that one was or we should have done it. Yeah. So I was a little worried about it. Uh, so we, we pull this, this sucker out. She was, uh, <clears throat> how do I say this the right way? She may have been with child with, with, with multiple child. piglets. Uh, <clears throat> so we're skinning her out and dude, there was probably what? Two inches of fat on her. Yeah, dude. It was like, 
So this was the same year that I was reading Moby Dick or <laughs> listening Moby Dick and you totally ruined it for me. Yeah, I totally ruined it for you. And I'm I like, think about the old hey. whale hunters pursuing blubber and fat and all this grease. I'm like, like, hey, have you gotten to the part yet with the shipwrecks? I'm like, well, a shipwreck? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> but that thing had that much grease oh, and dude. oil. We, we should have rendered it, but. I remember at one oh, well. point, so we we're, we're skinning it. And and the way that we were skinning this thing is just going basically down the the spine of it to open it up. And I remember we're then cutting away the the hide. And my five minutes in, not even two minutes in, my knife is so greased up that it slipped out of my hand and almost cut my other hand with it at one point. I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, this thing has a lot of fat on it. Well, and the other pig, what I was talking about, the big boar, where I'm like, oh, it had that much fat and we rendered it and it was totally Is that the one it. Kyle shot? Yeah. Okay. Because most of the pigs that I've killed down in Rock Springs are these raggly, like, yeah. hide like. We were like, talking about that earlier. Yeah, hide rock, like Brillo rock, pads. Rock pigs. These <laughs> long nose, like, dude, people don't know that mountain pigs are real. Yeah. <laughs> like, they look like anteaters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> long noses, long ears, long yeah. legs, no fat, really just rugged They're friggin' so weird things. Looking. But this was not a mountain pig, this, this was a greaser. And to the point that I, I feel bad admitting this, but when we were cleaning it, I cut Kyle with my knife <laughs> and Kyle cut Mario with his knife <laughs> just because we were, there was so much grease. There's we so couldn't even grease, hold dude. on to stuff. And, yeah. and uh, people have flagged me in terms of ethics and whatever, but that's another episode for another day. And we're just talking about, getting freaking real here dude it's real like at the end of the day it all sounds good in a studio when you when you put it in real life it's like dude stuff happens man you're 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 literally in the field trying to get stuff done all right so fast forward so i shoot this pig right we clean it out that was a fun day actually because we shot that thing like i shot it uh i I think we have a podcast on it. i shot it like yeah we do three minutes before legal light and with pigs doesn't matter there's no legal light, but literally you can't see after legal light when you're. Well, and I think it was like opening weekend of deer season, or like we were deer hunting, you're and then right. and it That's happened right. to be a pig that That's showed right. up. That's right. So we shot it, and we went looked for it the night we were camping out. That night we drank some beer. It was that was a fun night. So I'm like, all right, this is two weeks before we go hunt on this freaking like I got swindled on hunt, <laughs> and and so I'm like, all right, cool. Like my arrow flies straight. At an animal. Oh, by the way, earlier that day, I had shot at a turkey. I totally whiffed because uh, it was turkey season too. You could bow hunt a turkey. And this turkey runs by me and it like it saw me the whole way. I'm sitting 15, 20 feet up in a in a stand. I've yet to kill a turkey with a bow. Well, and I was being stupid. Like I had my gloves on still. I'm like, I can smoke this this thing. And it's running. A, I flung, fling an arrow. I'm like, I don't even, I cut off one of its like butt feathers and then it just kept running. I mean- it's hence the whole expression. It, it's a whole nother animal. It, yeah, it's a whole like nother it's, animal. You just have to think about it differently. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So we go on this Neil guy hunt. Uh, it's a Neil guy whitetail hunt. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we've already covered this in other episodes, but we're bow hunting. It's an ass whooping. Uh, we all, I, I was going to quit. <laughs> Well, and dude, there's people judging us for this stuff that are like, oh, you didn't make the most ethical shot. Oh, you had to finish off the pig with a knife, whatever. But dude, Dude, I almost quit. Like I was almost like, dude, I'm out. You almost quit after you rode your bike 10 miles that day. And then we camped beside an arroyo and we were covered in chigger bites. Dude, and if you remember, I, I, so it was like 95 degrees out. Oh yeah. At least. I remember. (laughs) I rode my bike so much that day and then hiked so much that day. We got back to camp after, I think it was way more than 10 miles. We got back to camp and Pliny and Kyle were like, man, I'm smoking. I'm really hot. I'm like, dude, I'm freezing. And and I think the reason was like, I had done so much Physical exertion. Yeah. I was like, I was cold. Well, you know, when you do like a lot of, at least for me, (laughs) revealing where I am in life, when you do a bunch of cardio and then you're like, dad bod, (laughs) you're like, I, I feel like I had a good workout. And when I, my belly and my ass are cold (laughs) (laughs) because it's just that weird, like you've burned a lot of calories and just like your body is like, it's this exothermic reaction where you can't build enough heat. Yeah. Dude, that's totally it. So we're, we're doing that and I'm, uh, so, so, so for anyone that's like, Hey, 
Uh, go make an ethical, like I get it, right? We, we all want to make ethical kills. First of all, when you bow hunt, really tough, whole nother level. Secondly, when you're public land hunting, bow hunting, and there's about 200 other jokers out there with you, and you're hiking or biking 10 miles in, like it's a, it's a different ball game than the guy that's like, hey, I set up a feeder, I set up a blind 100 yards away, which by the way, I love that too. It's just a different ball game. Yeah. You're, you're working a lot harder and, and there's, you, you said it perfectly. It's like hunting when you're in a blind and we've killed a lot of animals in a blind over a hundred yard feeder. But when you're hunting on public land, it's like a scatter shot. Like it's the unknown is that we had a guy literally running down the middle of this, this draw chasing a Neil guy. Yep. Like everything is different. Yeah. Like, oh, that's a wild card if I ever saw one. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's like, man, you can't, you can't, uh, the, 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 no, like I, I equate it all the time to the way that, so I'm in software, right? So the way you think about software is, well, the way it's designed is if I push A, then B happens. And then a customer gets in there to go, I push Z and Brown happened. Why did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's what happens yeah when you're doing that. Well, and I, I get to the point where I have videos where I'm like, I don't even know that I got good footage of it, but this last season I'm like 110 yards neck shot with a 270. Well, of course I can do that. I know I can do that way easier. Like that's just going to the grocery store for me. And I don't say that to be braggadocious, braggadocious. I say that just because it's like, once you know, you can do something, it's not a challenge, but when it's all these weird wild card, unpredictable situations where you just have to think, react, move. Yes. That's a different game. Different. Well, I mean, so, so Kyle and I were sitting on the side of this bridge on this draw. It's probably, I don't know, probably an 80 foot draw, uh, wide. And, and there's this bridge, like this land bridge going in between it. And I'm probably going to catch flack for this, but there was, there was a guy in blue jeans with a crossbow. He had picked up just the day before throwing rocks in the woods, trying to get someone out. Right. Uh, we had hiked in three hours before, like an hour and a half before first light. Yeah. Set up to be in a great position. And then some, some Yahoo comes in, at nine in the morning, an hour after sunrise, when we're all sitting there like, hey, deer are starting to move. Well, dude, it's difficult because we can get mad at that guy, but right. it's also like- But that's in, the wild in, card. In some, in some instance, though, it's like we can blame ourselves because we didn't get far enough. 100%. And, but that's the wild card, right? And that's something that I think going back to, to bow hunting, getting drawn, the Neil guy hunt, public land, like there's so many wild cards- that first of all, I, like I was brand new to hunting, so I had a whole different expectation, which is why halfway through I'm like, dude, this sucks. Like I'm out. You literally said, I'm going to quit, go to lunch and go to the beach. We're so close. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to go to the beach. I'm gonna you go to, said that. I I'm going to call you no, out. No, I totally it. did. I was going to go to South Padre Island. <laughs> I was going to buy a nice necklace of shells for my wife. And then I was going to come back and I was going to laugh in their faces because they hadn't killed anything. And still. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I said something like, go take a break, go have a nice oh, lunch. I was, fired. I was so fired up. But but come back. So, you, you won't regret it. And so here's what I did. This is actually a really funny story. So I drove into town and town's 30 minutes away. And town is like a Walmart and a Mexican food restaurant, right? So I went to the Mexican food restaurant. By the way, unbelievable food. I called my wife. I'm like, I am so frustrated right now. Like, Do you know what I was doing th- then? You're sitting out there eating your your hunter sticks and cheese. Uh, yeah, I was laying in the dirt, <laughs> half asleep eating tuna yeah. out of a bag. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I I had done that the day before. Like we we were what, 4 days in at that point, something like that. And I was just like I had I had missed a deer the first day, like a, a decent buck, I, again bow hunting, right? I shot right over the top of him at about 30 yards. Then the next day I missed the doe at about 40 yards and she jumped the string on me. I'm like, I can't, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I can't, I can't hunt something with a bow. Like I'm terrible at this. So I'm frustrated and I'm a, I'm an up and down guy. I really am like Mm -hmm. on my highs, dude, Mm -hmm. everyone wants to be around me on my highs and my lows. Everyone's like, dude, get that guy out of here. Like he's making a scene. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the reality of who I am. Right. So I end up going. It's you're the extreme high and the extreme oh, low. Oh, for sure. Kyle's my like rock steady right in the middle, <laughs> and I'm just kind of all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle's like, dude, I just killed an amazing elk. Isn't that amazing? And then he's like, 
dude, I just missed a shot on an amazing elk. Isn't that amazing? And both times, like, he's he's just Mr. Cool about it. Whereas you're like, dude, I'm going to do- Mother effort, did you see that shot? Like, oh, my God. I'm going to do nothing but hunt the rest of my life. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to do everything. Yeah, the next or, like, or like, I'm going to quit. I, my bow's already on Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. I, I go the Steve Rennell route. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take up golf. Because at least when I go golfing, I golf. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I go out to lunch. I'm sitting there. I get this great soup. Uh, <laughs> it was a great dude. It, like they bring you the soup. It wasn't even like you order it. They bring you the soup. I call my wife afterwards. He says that they bring you the soup. Dude, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so, so, so it needs to be said. If you're ever down in that area, you got to get the soup. Uh, so, so, so I call my wife and she's like, I'm like, I'm coming home. I'm like, this is ridiculous. She's like, what are you talking about? Like, You're like, didn't that guy ride with you? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, you can ride back with Kyle. He'll be fine. So I start, like, this is, this, this is kind of where I go. When I get super frustrated, I start praying, right? And I'm like, Lord, just, I, I, it was funny. The song comes on my Pandora and it's a song that says, uh, it's a country music song. I like country music. And it's a song by, um, uh, gosh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. But he, he basically says, uh, the hunt's not always about the kill, right? And he said that, and it, it stuck in my mind, and I'm praying. And my prayer wasn't like, Lord, help me kill this massive Neil guy, right? It was just more like, Lord, help me have peace about, like, help me have fun. Like, I'm down here. I took five days off of work. Like, help me have fun with this. Like, I'm not having fun. And again, this is my personality, right? So I get back, and <laughs> I don't even want to tell this part, because everyone already knows it, probably, because if they've listened to it, but it's ridiculous. Dude, this whole thing's about getting real. Dude, so we we end up getting out of the truck. We walk. Uh, I meet up with with Kyle and Plenty, and we're like, all right, we're going to go back. It's probably three, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. We walk down this bike trail. So the way this was, there's all these these trails. You can't drive them. You ride a bike, and then you split off, and you go where you go. So we're walking down this bike trail. They all go before me. They go to where they're going. I'm going, I'm talking to this guy. There's this other guy on the trail. He's wearing, you know, wearing orange. We're all wearing orange. Just walking. He's like, uh, hey, did you see that deer up there? I'm like, what are you talking about? And these two other guys come walking the other way, and they're like, hey, there's a doe back there. And they're hauling two Neil guy. They had just killed two bull Neil guy. I didn't realize it was two different people. I thought that was the same guy. No, it's two different people. Like, thinking, what, two years back to yeah, when yeah. this happened. No, so I'm, I'm, I'm biking, and I come up to this guy. He's a big dude. Um, and he's, he's like, yeah, yeah, I haven't seen anything yet. And he's like, yeah, I heard there's a deer up there. And then these, I saw a deer up there. He said, not heard. I saw a deer up there. And then these two guys come the other way and they've got a game cart with two Neil guy bull heads on it. And they're like, yeah, we just shot two Neil guy bulls and it's taken us, you know, all day. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. It's taken them literally all day to get them out. <clears throat> and which now we have a huge appreciation for oh, that. Dude, it, dude, that took us two, an hour and a half to butcher it, another hour and a half to get it out. And we packed it out, what, a third of a mile? Yeah. Like, no, it was probably half a mile. Half a mile. Yeah. But still. But still, yeah. Yeah. So, so we end up, um, we end up, uh, we end up talking, and this guy's like, yeah, I, th- I think I saw it up there. And we see, we see this doe all saying, she's probably, I don't know, 80 yards up. I'm like, hey, man. Uh, obviously you knew about it first. Um, you going to hunt it. He's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. Which also super cool that oh. you had that conversation because there are too many situations where public land hunters are just dicks to each other where it's yeah. like you're racing each other to the deer and then you just both ruin it for each yeah. other. So cool that you actually had, yeah. regardless of how it worked out, yeah. that you're well, actually like, I'm not going to go for it. You go for it. Well, it gets cooler. Cause I was like, He's like, I was like, Hey dude, do you want to go for it? He's like, no, dude, I'm, I, I don't, I'm going for, I'm going for a Neil guy and a buck. And I said, cool. Do you mind if I go for it? He's like, no. He's like, in fact, I'll range it for you. Right. Cause again, bow hunting, right. Ranging is super. I don't think I told you this. No, I didn't know that. <clears throat> so he walks up about 15 yards. And I thought I, he just kind of walked by. No, no. He, he hung out with me for a while. So he, he didn't see me shoot it. Cause he walked off cause the deer ran away and then I shot it later, but he ends up range it for me. He's like, Hey, it's 65 yards. So I get off my bike. I took my bow out and I'm walking up and I, I, anyway, I kind of stalk it. The thing runs in the woods on the right side of the road. And it was trying to get over to the left side of the road. We don't know why, but it was trying to get over. And so he was helping me range it. And then I end up, you know, saying, Hey, it ran off, it ran into the right side of the, of the woods. And he's like, all right, I'm going to keep walking. And I'm like, Hey, I'm going to stay here and just try to hunt. He's like, cool, man. Good luck. Right. And so 
I just kind of, everyone walks away. It's just me now. But dude, like even your interaction with this dude, it's, it's something that I've realized. Like maybe it's just Texas. I don't think it is. I think it's pretty universal that like public land bow hunters, there's this weird, like insane degree of optimism that like we're, we know we're getting our ass kicked, but we still see the potential and we see other people who have the same mentality and yeah, we're kind of competing against each other, but we're going to, we're going to root for them. Oh dude. And like the people I've met bow hunting, doing it the hard way, like Laguna is a great example. Literally you're riding a bicycle with a bow miles into public land wearing orange, like it's so hard with two other 200 other hunters out there. And the majority of the people that you meet are just cool as shit. They're, they're cool dudes. Because yeah. they're like, we understand that you're doing it the hard way. And I want to get something for me. But if you are successful, you know what? That's pretty darn cool. Dude. When I saw those two guys with the two bull Neil guys go by on with the game cart, I'm like, dude. And we stopped, we, t- we chatted for, you know, five minutes. I'm like, Dude, tell me, he's like, dude, I, we smoked one. The other one we shot, the, the first one ran, you know, 300 yards. The other one ran a mile. We tracked it. We have a third one down. We can't find it. I'm like, dude, that's cool, man. Like, yeah. that's what we're all here for. So this guy ends up leaving. Long story. I, we already talked about this. I don't want to go into detail, but uh, I end up staying there. I kind of hide back in this brush. Uh, the, the doe comes out. She walks across the road. Uh, she comes over to me. She's about 22, 23 yards away. I, I do a meh call. I shoot her. She runs what? So when you say I do the meh call, what's really funny is like you, you see it on all these like outdoor channel TV shows where it's like emulating like a doe in heat. Like, meh. but I, it, it was it's literally to make a noise to make it. Look. It was it was Tyler and Casey from the Element. Uh, podcast who really classified this well for me. They're like, yeah, I see a deer. So I make a gadwall call. I go, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. sounds like a distant duck quack. That's it. I had never thought about it that way. But then when they said that, I'm like, that's exactly what it and is. And that's exactly the sound I made. <laughs> but it works. It totally works. This thing stops, looks at me. I, I fling my arrow. She runs 60 yards in this really tall grass, ends up falling. Plenty and Kyle come over. We get it out, and I'm like, man, that was different than that pig hunt Yeah, over a feeder sitting in a stand, and that was different than any rifle hunt I've ever done. And what's interesting is, like, that whole thing, like, in in the video series, it's a 10-second clip, kind of, like, hyperlapsed of us, like, oh, we found, like, you're excited, I shot a doe, cool, let's go find it, and then we drag it out. Right. But... That doesn't convey the full There's story four days of what it meant to get to that point yes. and to get it done. Yes. And to drop a deer in the high grass. On public land with yeah. a bow. Like it was it was four days of getting our asses whooped and like chigger. I have I have two hundred chiggers on me. Uh I, I had laid down the day before during during the, the uh noon break and I got ticks and chiggers all over me from that. And like you hadn't gotten bit by a scorpion yet. <laughs> just say it. <laughs> That's true. But it's just like the, the overwhelming sense of relief. Right. And it's not even like, it's so weird when you bow hunt. It's like you're, if you've ever been in like a high stakes situation in, in your, in your job where you're sitting there going like, man, I got to nail this presentation or I got to do this thing. Right. And you have that your like job, sports, anything, anything where just like the pressure's on and like you're puckered up the whole time, even <laughs> as you're doing it. Like, seriously, that's how it is. I'm puckered up the whole time. I shoot this deer and I'm like, and, and I was puckered up until we found it. Then I'm like, oh my God, I shot one. Like yeah. it was unbelievable. And and it was funny because the whole time we're talking about this, there's some asshole is screaming. Oh, I shot a nail. You everyone hear him. Right. I'm like, what a jerk. He's messing up everyone's hunt. I shoot. I'm like, I got one. I'm screaming yeah. and yelling. Please like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm that asshole now. <laughs> dude, it's one of those things where you can, everybody can play the moral high ground game where you're just like, oh, well, ethics say you should do this and you should be polite for other hunters. Dude, emotions should, come in, man. And yes, that, that is true. But when you have a victory, 
Oh. Dude. And dude, this was a dough. Yeah. Like, I've smoked tons of doughs. But it's, this was a dough on it, public it, land a with a bow. In, in an interesting and powerful and unique way. And celebrate that stuff. Oh, man. dude, it was awesome. It was the first tagged animal I got with a bow on public land, all that together at the same time. And again, I hadn't hunted long, so it was like, and then there was so much, I mean, keep in mind, I told you guys, like, I was going to quit, you yeah. know? I was like, dude, and I wasn't really going to quit, but I just wanted to let everyone know that how, pa- how pissed off I was, you know? I was mad. And then all of a sudden, I dropped this thing, and I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this yeah. is the coolest thing in the world. So, all right, so fast forward. We do a lot of hunting in between then. Then Pliny and I, this last year, this will go quick. We go down to... Uh, to probably about 20 miles from Laguna, 30 miles from Laguna. Somewhere. So this place called Teniente, we get drawn for Neil guy hunt, um, bow hunt, <coughs> Neil guy and, and whitetail. I end up shooting a Neil guy early on. It was an amazing. By early on, you mean two hours into the first day? Well, I mean, we were there the day before scouting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So literally probably not even two hours in. Like we found a great spot. I hid under this this unbelievable covering of a mesquite tree. The sun's coming up over my back. The wind's in my face. And that's valuable, too. It's not just, like, dumb luck you ran into. Like, no. you were in a great spot. Yeah. Like, we, I hunted this thing. You found a great spot. Like, I did everything that I could control extremely well. The animal came and, look, and I've, I told Rox this, right, my wife. I said, if Pliny was there, if Kyle was there, if literally anyone that's a decent bow hunter was there, chances are 95% of them would have killed this animal. Just happened that I was there. And the reality is I did Dude, everything and, and right. Let's not discount it. Like that's worth a lot. It is. The fact that you're like, I identified a good spot and I made a point to be there when other, literally no one else did. Correct. That's worth a lot. Yes, correct. And so I look at it and go, I did everything right. And it happened the, the Neil guy came in and I was telling plenty about this earlier. Cause so I, I, uh, it was actually really cool. We shot this thing in November and then, you know, plenty and I carved it up, brought it out and it was, we have a whole series on this. So go watch that. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It'll drop soon. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And then, uh, <clears throat> I brought it in. So it wasn't, it was probably a, I would say it's a four year old Neil guy, probably somewhere around there. I have no idea how to I age don't, him. yeah, I he don't really know how to age. Pounds. Yeah. It, it a, was a, not a super mature right. bull. A mature bull is 700 pounds. Yeah. 650, Six, 700. Yeah. yeah. But this was probably a, a four hundo. Yeah. Full, full skeletal size, yeah. not full mass. Big animal. Biggest animal I've ever seen. But delicious. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this joker comes out. There's a bull behind him. And he, he walks out through this little draw that I was, I was actually set up looking at that draw. He walks out through that. I had seen a, a big buck run through there before. You say draw. I don't know how to... It's like an opening. I don't know if you know what a draw is. It's not a draw. It's not It's not a draw <laughs> like in the West. Uh, how do I say it? It's when, like a... When I say draw as a Southerner, I mean a little valley, a little depression. I agree. A, a little drainage. And uh, uh, that's what, 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 what Yankees would call a coulee. I have no idea what a coolie is. It, a, a little, a, a place where it gets a little quiet <laughs> and the, the, the cold air goes when things settle down. So it's a mini. This was, this was all flat. No, 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 no. It was a mini draw. Mm. If you look, so, all right, so help me explain this then. And I just did the gadwall thing. You totally did the gadwall <laughs> thing. So, so there's mesquite trees on one side and these these, I don't know if they're yucca or what on the other side. And there's this little pathway, and the pathway goes down into a rain drainage. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. So probably not a draw. But we're talking about an elevation difference of, I agree. of 14 feet. Uh, I don't even think it was that much. <laughs> Seven feet. <laughs> probably about a foot and a half. <laughs> but ultimately, the way that I'm going to articulate it is, it was a draw. Okay? It was, it was a depression in the earth, and these Neil guy... Had a natural pathway out, yeah, in between these big bushes, if you will. So these these Neil guy come through this natural depression, and the big one, the one I shot, is coming first. I think it was a bachelor pad, right? If you think about uh, buck hunting, uh, when you have like young bachelor bucks, yeah, it's just like that pre rut. Yes, you know, they're just hanging out together. Late October. The difference is those those bucks are usually about a hundred pounds. 
these jokers are 400 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> like they're a big animal. So he ends up coming, walking out. He didn't see me. The one behind him was kind of looking in my direction. Again, I had the right wind and I was under a shadow because the sun was in their face, but he kept looking at me. So I, I don't want to ruin the whole story. The one in the back finally looks down. I drew my bow. I held it for about a minute and a half, two minutes. The one in the front that was the bigger Neil guy finally turns broad. I, I had like a straight on shot. And I'm like, man, he was 40 yards away. I don't trust my shot at 40 yards to hit his throat. Like, I just don't trust myself. Like I would probably. Well, it's it's a tough shot. And, and there are people who screw up that shot. So I appreciate your, if it was your 15, discernment there. If it was 20 yards, I'd probably have taken it. Yeah. But at 40 yards, I'm like, man, I just don't feel good about that. As someone who is both royally effed up a shot at a range <laughs> yeah. that I thought was easy, but also nailed a pig between the eyes and stoned it dead. Yeah. It comes that, down to discernment. Yeah, it does. And and I think you made the right call. So this, this the, 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 the Neil guy in the back, it was two bulls. Neil mm-hmm. guy in the back, I would say... If my mine was about four hundred, this one was about three hundred pounds. So it was, it was you know three quarters of the size. Dude, that was more than three hundred. No, mine was four hundred. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The one in the back was probably three hundred. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I so the one in the it, back so. was staring at me. He looks down half second. I draw. The one in the front still looking straight. He, he I don't think the one in the front ever saw me. I was telling plenty of this earlier. Cause we've got, I've got the mount on my wall now. It took the guy. You, you got it. What? Two days ago. Yeah, dude. I'm so fired and up. The, like the whole reason I, I didn't have anything to do after work today. So I came over with a six pack of beer and Daniel was like, come over with some beer. Come look check at out this new oh, guy. Look at my new guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> but dude, I have, so I had the new guy next to the axis DR shot and it's like, holy crap. This thing is a freaking monster. Yeah, order so, of magnitude bigger. Uh, and that that so that uh, axis I shot was probably just under two hundred pounds. And this joker, you're looking at him, you're like, yeah, I can see why he was so much bigger. So anyway, so so the one in front, uh, the one I shot, finally, uh, sorry, the one in the back finally looks down. The one I shot turns sideways. I drew, holding it for two minutes. He turns sideways, broadside on me. He's thirty five yards away. Again, I, so this is actually something you taught me when you're both rifle hunting doesn't really matter, right? If it's a hundred to 150 yards with a 270 or six, five or a 30 out six or two forty three, you're still going to hit the kill zone between a hundred and 150 yards. If that animal moves a little bit, you'll be fine. Yeah. You got plus or minus one and a half inches. Correct. So you're good with a bow, uh, 20 to 30 yards. You will miss your shot. hundred yep. percent. Miss your shot. Trust yep. me. I've done it. So Pliny's like. Hey, before you hunt, as soon as first light comes out, map out your battlefield. Understand, like, look at a tree, know where that tree is, know how many yards it is, 28 yards, 32 yards, 48 yards. So I did that. And I, and, and I say that because I've tried to range an animal you can't when do it was it. crucial time and it's ruined my hunt. Yeah. I've been 100%. standing there trying to tag an animal. Maybe my range finder wasn't good enough. Even when I was using a nice range finder, it was just like I was trying to hit the animal and figure it out instead of understanding the situation where I was working in. Yeah, 100%. and if you can understand, okay, that stumps at twenty three, that that rock is at thirty one, the animal's halfway between. That's way better than in the moment trying to range the animal. So in this draw <laughs> that they came through, the back trees. I'm like, all right, those are forty five. These front trees are thirty. This joker is at about 35 to 38 yards. So I, he turns, they both look away from me for half a second. He's standing broadside. I pull my bow up and literally my, and by the way, on like, if this was a video, my uh, right hand is by my cheek right now as if I'm actually drawing my bow. Uh, my 20, 30. Oh, your anchor point looks horrible. Yeah. I'm judging you. I look, look, I've drank a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my 20, 30 and 40 yard pin are on the, on the broad side of this animal. Yeah. So you're like, like, I'm literally all pins are on it. I'm like, dude, I got this guy. And, and I, and I, I bring it down a little bit and I go, all right, 35 yards is basically where I think he's at. I let it fly. I've, I messed up mashing down on the GoPro, which I still regret, but it would have been an awesome video. Arrow flies. It's like a perfect flight. It's like the the little arc flight hits him. It sticks. And I had a I had a, a two blade 
uh, fixed blade. Um, what is it? The True Glow. It was the True Glow Titanium X, which is an amazing broadhead. It's a great broadhead. But now that GSM has acquired True Glow, and it is that broadhead is now being brought into the NAP line as the NAP Endgame, I'm a little skeptical of it in the future. So but the early production models are amazing. The the present one was great. So I shoot this thing. I see the arrow sticking out. I'm like, dang it. Like, I didn't get a lot of penetration. We had talked a lot about that before the hunt. I'm like, man, do I go with a slasher that is going to leave a big blood trail? Because these guys can run a mile if you hit them. If you puncture one lug, they'll run a mile and maybe they'll die. If you puncture two lungs, they could still run 500 yards and maybe they'll die. Dude, and what put the proof in the pudding for me is when I shot a 204-pound pig. I put it right through the heart. It ran 31 yards and just dumped over yeah. right there. Yeah. And at that point, I'm like... Yeah, penetration is what matters. Yeah. And this broadhead punches like crazy. And that was it. So I'm like, all right, I'm going the two blade, shot this guy, saw the arrow sticking out. He runs kind of as he's running, thrashing a little bit, and the, the arrow breaks off. And he ran, he was on my right at 35 yards. He runs about 30 yards to my left, and he stops and looks at me. So this goes through my mind, by the way. I don't think I've told you this. No. So I immediately knock an arrow. Because in my mind, I've heard all these stories about hunting Neil Guy with a bow where they get pissed off when they're hurt and they charge somebody. Well, what we found out actually in hindsight that I don't remember if it was the game warden who told us this or the other guy in the Ford who showed up later, but that Tiniente was actually the place where a father and son had hunted and they had shot a Neil Guy and then it gored one of them. Right. And no, it gored them both. It killed them both. Yeah, it, w- it was there. So I, yeah. I, I think you're... I like what your thought process. Yeah. Now they was they had, was they out had, of a healthy respect. Yes, and they had walked up on so they had injured it, they hadn't killed it. They walked up on it when it was still dying and then it gored them and killed them. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there like, man, and, and granted, I'm I'm not scared of it coming after me, but there's a healthy respect of this is a massive animal with horns. Well, and you have a much more healthy respect like I've been charged by a boar hog (laughs) and and I've been charged by a boar hog two different times and I've shot so many hogs and people have talked about me negatively on some of my podcasts about how I, I don't apply all my ethics to hogs, but after, after they've charged me and all this stuff, I'm just like F them, man. (laughs) Like no, it's just warfare. Yeah. But I, I think the way you approached it was out of a very healthy respect. Well, and I, I thought I had a really good shot on it, and I actually I did. I, had a, I I'm not a great bow hunter. This isn't a brag on me. I got lucky. I had an unbelievable shot on this animal, dude. It, it was exactly what you practice, though. When you when you practice something and strive for that, and then you do it, that's not luck. I mean, there's maybe a little bit of luck that the animal happened to show up in the right place at the right time, but the fact that you executed executed the shot in the manner exactly as you intended, that's yeah. not luck at all. It was a very good shot. This thing runs, again, I knock an arrow because it starts looking at me. I'm like, man, I don't think it'll charge me, but if it does, I'm going to throw another arrow at it. And then all of a sudden it does the death call, right? It starts coughing up blood, starts wobbling in the legs and falls over and starts kicking. And I'll tell you, man, I have never been so excited in my entire life (laughs) other than my children's birth when I saw that thing fall. Because I was like, and Pliny's still hunting. He's he's 200 yards away from me. I'm like, I can't be like, I'm I'm 200 yards away looking at the east filming pelicans. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, this I'm is like, beautiful and I'm majestic and back, so still. I'm trying to hold back <laughs> screaming at the top of my lungs like, I just killed the bull. <laughs> so I go up to it and we end up, I go get plenty. And the video's coming out. It's, it's a, it, was, it, was, it was a highlight of my hunting career for sure. So all that being said, I got the I got the Neil guy. Uh, we shot it in November. I just got it. What is today? Uh, end of February, call it. Um, so it didn't take very long. It was really it. it the guy did an amazing Tony Foster, amazing job out of Allen. Um, if anyone needs a taxidermist in Texas, North Texas, this guy did an amazing job. He did it very quickly. So all this comes back in to, the way you say that. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. Props to this dude who does it well. But I'm also a little bit worried that I'm like, I hope he doesn't get too busy to work yeah, on yeah, my yeah, stuff. Yeah. Hey, Tony, ours takes priority. 
<laughs> no, he, he's legit. He he did my fallow and he did my best buck and and this guy does amazing work. And sometimes it takes a while, but it's not because he's slow. It's because he's relying on forms and other third party people who are slow. Yeah, no, he does a good job. So all that coming back to our conversation earlier before we started the podcast of the different levels of meat consumption. Yeah. We we started this. We just talked about Nilgai hunting and Teniente and public land and archery. And we had no intention of really even talking about those things specifically. We were just talking about all this stuff in terms of what does hunting mean to you in terms of how you acquire meat, what hunts are more meaningful than others. And that's just kind of where it naturally went. And, well, and I think like, that's valuable. And, and like, uh, totally agree. And, and then there's the whole other group of people that don't hunt that acquire meat. Yeah. Right. And that's where... I was five or six years ago, I acquired a lot of meat that I never acquired, if that makes sense, right? And so that's where the levels come in. So when I think about it, I can go to a grocery store tomorrow and forget about chickens and turkeys and all that. Let's talk about red meat, what you can actually hunt, right? I know there's doves. You can hunt turkeys. I I know that, right? Well, you've never killed a turkey. I've never. never, (laughs) I'm uh, just busting your balls a bit. (laughs) I've never seen a turkey. (laughs) Yeah, you have. Not not a gobbler coming at me when I have a shotgun. Not a legal turkey while you were intentionally hunting them. I've never seen a legal turkey while I'm hunting them. By the way, turkey hunting is a sham. (laughs) No, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. I can't wait to kill a it's it's all or nothing. It's either the the most frustrating thing you've ever experienced and what the hell are these mythical birds that I'm not even seeing or it's, wow, th- this was just beauty and magic in the And woods. I'm on the front side of that right now and I feel like I killed a Neil guy that's 400 pounds that would fill about, I don't know, 200 turkeys and I'm like, why would I go kill a turkey <laughs> right now? <laughs> it makes my turkey soup not look so cool. <laughs> it's pretty good though. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to shoot a turkey. This is uh, this is definitely a little bit of jealousy because I've never I've heard them I've never seen one in strut that I would that I would have a shot at. But that said, all right. So I go to a grocery store, right? And this is what our conversation started in about about ground beef or steak or whatever, even fish. You can even take it to fishing. Yeah, you really could. Which, by the way. I just made maybe a great decision or maybe a stupid decision, but I bought a John boat and a motor and, and I'm hoping to get into fishing in a more serious level. So hopefully more fishing content coming soon. I can't wait. We're going to go do it. Or it'll be one of those things that we laugh at and regret big time. Well, I mean, look, uh, I didn't put any money into it, so I'm good. Well, based on my experience <laughs> at the DMV today, <laughs> ass kicking one, yep, already a little bit down. <laughs> yeah, 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 no doubt, no doubt. All right, so all these foods at the grocery store, meat, right? Level, I'm going to call it level one. Level one, somebody else raises these animals in a farm, salmon included. yeah. With, with cows and pigs and, and all these other, like red meat, what do they do? They put a spike through its head, through its brainstem, kill it. Then they have a process to butcher it. Then people that hunt or don't hunt, and this isn't, a, by the way, this is not a knock on people that don't hunt. It, it really isn't. It's just understanding where your meat comes from. So level one is you go to the grocery store with zero emotional attachment to the animal that you're eating. You literally look at it as a commodity. Yeah, right? it's just like getting gas. At the it's pump. like getting gas. It literally is, right? And and that's something that I never thought about before I started hunting. And my wife actually never thought about. And now my wife uh, is very, very high on this, myself obviously included, where I would say that probably 80 to 90% of the red meat that we consume as a family now is stuff that I've hunted. And my wife has gotten on board with that. My kids are like, oh, daddy killed this, right? And, and in fact, my kids, like, we cook hamburgers. My Dude, kids like, I've been over here, and you've been cooking food, and, and I see your son run in and say, Daddy, did you shoot it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in a way, as a single guy who's never experienced that, it's I'm amazing, like, dude. dude, that's what it's all it's freaking what it's all about. Because Eli's been, so my son Eli, there's a video with him hunting some deer with us. He's been on these trips, right? So he's like, I know what it's like. I, he's never pulled the trigger, but he's been part of it. So and, and it's not about eating food. It's no, about no. it's about I'm eating food 
that actually means yes. something. Yes. So level one is you're, you're, uh, and this, look, we all do it. It's not a bad thing. You're going to a grocery store, you're going to a restaurant, you're eating meat that you have not seen killed. Are you calling me out on that Chick fil A? 100%. Yeah. Chicken man. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were. Chicken and fries. I thought you were. So level two, and again, this is just arbitrary what we've come up with after a couple of beers, right? Level two in my mind is, again, this is where I was for a long time until Pliny's like, hey, dude, during COVID, he's like, hey, go buy a bow. It's 100, 150 yards, take a shot on an animal. It is very personal at that point. You did it yourself. You earned it. Maybe it wasn't the hardest possible your goal wasn't to do it in the hardest way possible. Your goal was to get it done, but you did. Yeah, and that could dude, that could even be a western hunt at 350 yards after stalking it, right? Yeah, it, like, it all is situational. I think it's all situ- it, But the the point in level two in my mind. So so again, taking the levels. Level one is completely removed, no emotional attachments to the animal. Level two is you're taking a shot through a scope, and there's an emotional attachment. Because you're pulling the trigger, but that animal is 100 or even 50 all the way out to 500 yards away. And, and I feel like there's also something where, like, I do that a lot. Yes. Uh, like, I, I've been further down this road that I think you're about to get into, but I still, my goal is to hunt kind of all seasons, all disciplines. So I do a lot of this, as you call it, level two hunting, and I don't necessarily describe it in the most accurate and emotional and detailed way because I've done it enough that it's not as powerful to me, but it still is kind of amazing in its own it right. Totally that instead of just relying on the grocery store to get my yes. red meat. Yes. Yeah. Even if it's a deer under a feeder at a hundred yards, I 100%. still went out there and got it myself. Like that still has a lot of value, but I think what you're about to talk about is stuff that's, a little bit more meaningful than even that. Well, it's, it's, it's meaningful. So, so by the way, level two, like probably 95% of the animal, 90% of the animals I've killed are what I would describe as level two. And every single one of them that I've killed with uh, the pull of a trigger is an amazing emotional experience for me. It is. It's man, I killed that. And again, I get real sentimental about the stuff I told you all before. I'm highs and lows kind of a guy. I get sentimental about it like I am providing food for my family. Now, I get it, right? We live in America. We can go to the, the grocery store and buy the meat. But the, the, the internal uh, man part of us all that are, that are, are men or hunters that say, hey, I'm going to go out and, and I'm going to kill and I'm going to provide. You're like, I did something that's valuable. Correct. Damn it. Like, it's, I, I didn't outsource it to somebody else. I went out and got it done. Correct. And it's valuable to me it's valuable. and to my family. Yes. And it's and there's there's literally zero knock on that. Now, I'm gonna get into level three. And this is not a knock on level two. It's a knock on level one. All of it's a knock on level one, honestly. But again, I think folks should go and experience hunting. Like folks that look at level one and go, I'm gonna go to the grocery store and then they get mad at hunters. Go experience hunting first. By the way, I'm just going to throw out, totally to interrupt you, yeah. that buying the like unmeat patty at McDonald's or Burger King so or level whatever. Level negative 20. Level zero <laughs> yeah. or lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 100%. That is not only failed persi- the beyond participation, yeah, yeah. but it is synthesizing all that is value failed. of level one. <laughs> failed participation. That's great. That's great. That's that's exactly what it is. Anyway, yeah. that's like negative a million. That's so a negative. That's we a negative. went to zero, one, but two, look, and now you're at three. In all honesty, a level one is like I want to say this the right way. It's not like it's a bad person, right? Like I don't think anyone that eats meat's a bad person. Uh, I don't think vegans are. Ba- I don't think anyone's a bad person. Oh, I'm glad because that's like ninety nine percent of the population. But what I, what I what I equate the levels to is the the emotional connection to the animal. Yeah. Right. So at level one, you literally have z- you don't know what that animal looked like. You don't know if it was a brown cow, a black and white cow. 
You have no clue what color that cow was. Dude, I'd be really interested, and maybe this is a future episode, talking to somebody who did like 4-H or yes, something. Yes, yes, 100%. Where it's like, I raised that cow, I understood that cow, I fed it, I know what it ate, I understood it. I understood my connection with food, meat, and this human-animal relationship yes. at a deeper level. I think that would be super interesting. I do too. And by the way, so we we went to Fredericksburg, Texas, and we met with this. We, we stayed at this place, and it was a a, ran, a farmer. It wasn't a ranch. He was a farmer, and he had a he had a cattle uh, operation on the ran, or on the the property. They gave birth to a, a a young cow, and they were going to eventually butcher that cow. That's a different level than one, two, and three. It is because you have a whole emotional connection for two years before you slaughter that. Yeah. Animal. That's like a level four, yeah. right? Now, all right, so coming back to it. So level zero, and again, this is emotional connect. It's not about whether you're good or bad. It's a level zero or level one, excuse me, level zero is like you're not a meat eater. Like, I don't know why. Yeah, I'm, you're just not participating. You probably shouldn't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> level, level. You probably found my podcast because you like backpacking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, level one is... Complete emotional detachment. We're all there. Everyone's done it. Level two is an emotional attachment. You took an animal's life and you either processed it yourself or you brought it to someone to process it, but you took an animal's life. Level three is, I'm going to go back to the Neil guy example that I shot because okay. it's, it's, I've only shot three animals with my bow. That Neil guy sticks out to me. It's, it's seared into my memory. When it came through the draw, <laughs> It was eating grass. Meaning your physical act of pulling back your right arm? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. That, that's it, an acceptable <laughs> definition of a draw. When it came through the creek bed, it was chewing grass. I heard its jaws chomping. Literally. Yeah. I, I could see it was, I could see it's like, it, I couldn't actually literally see its breath, but I could see it breathing. I could see its nostrils flaring. And I drew back my bow and I put an arrow through it. And the whole time I watched it run to a place very close to me where it, it, it ended. It died. Dude, this is where people are either going to think I'm very philosophical and interesting or I'm just totally full of shit. Or psychotic. Yeah. But at a point you got to the point where you're like, I see it eat. Therefore, I can do something where I can eat. Correct. I see it breathe. Therefore, I can act to where years in the future, I can continue to breathe. 100%. And, and you get to a point where you realize it's, it's the life of me or this animal, not because it's totally forced in a survival situational so, situation, but you understand the value of life and that it's an exchange. It is an, that's a great, and it's an exchange. And, and maybe again, maybe I'm trying to be like wax poetic and be very philosophical and just absolutely full of shit here. You probably think I am, but life is super valuable. Life is extremely valuable. And it gets to the point where you just value life and you say, I see life. I assess it for the value that it contains, that it is, and I empathetically and and intentionally transfer that to my own. And 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 I think you articulate that well because ultimately life is valuable. Therefore, if we go to level one, two, or three, at level three, where I can truly see, like li- like literally thirty yards from me, a life turning into a non living animal that then I carve out the, the, the sustenance of and feed myself and my family. You compare that to a level one where there's complete emotional detachment, right? So there's a, there's yeah, a, like, yes, for, but hold on for me, there's a huge emotional, uh, like it's an excitement, but there's an emotional interaction with that animal on level three at level one, dude, I can go to the grocery store right now and, like I have, I have three pounds of ground beef in my fridge right now. I think I suffer from a bit of level two numbness, and to the point that I agree with that. That level three is super exciting to me, to the point that it it is amazing. It is the highest of highs, or I I messed it up and it's the lowest of lows. But 
a few days ago, a pig ran up a few yards from me. I shot it in the freaking face and didn't feel a lot. And I got it done. Yeah. In a very detached manner. And I took level two into almost a level one going to the grocery store yes. mentality. Yes. And it's interesting to me because it's this kind of callousness and numbness, but but still I went out and did it. But I think, so this is what I think about your hunting. You've done uh, way more hunting than I would say the average hunter has. <sighs> Man, it's so tough. No, but it's but so seriously. situational. Okay, so you're right. It's situational. But I also think that you've you've had that experience more, right? You've shot more animals from a stand, from a hiding spot, from wherever with a rifle, right? And I think that that brings you to that uh, level one and a half, like, hey, I'm still emotionally connected to this because Absolutely. I did it. But yeah. let me ask you a question. The pig you shot in the face. And I probably know <laughs> which, the answer here. Which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you shot a deer versus a pig, and by the way, I'm sorry, on this uh, podcast, uh, we view pigs as Jesus does. We send demons into them and they run into the ocean. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the truth. Uh, Jesus must have been from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's the quote of the night. So if it was a deer versus a pig, would the emotional connection have been different? Absolutely. I did a full podcast episode basically talking about head and neck shots on game. And it kind of boils down to I probably would never take a headshot on a deer. Right. But on a pig, I wouldn't think twice about it. I'm going to try it every time. So my point in that is the emotional disconnection of of pigs is one thing because they're pigs. Like they're well, different. And for us, it's an opera. Like people judge it as this like really abstract concept of ethics that ethics apply universally all the time. And in a philosophical manner, I agree towards humanity, but this turns into a conversation of opportunity. And when the rancher or the, the landowner wants you to kill as many pigs as possible. And I noticed that there's so many pigs on this property that they're messing up the opportunities on wild game. And then we need to kill as many as possible. I'm going to take whatever shot I can. And, and I'm not going to be extremely sentimental about it. And you're so the, so going back to the level one, two, right? Cause this isn't a three, three is, is being up close and personal level one, two, the, the level uh, one is you go to the store and it's it's literally a transactional process. Yeah. Emotionally, right? Yeah. Like I literally am in and out of the store within five minutes of all I'm doing is buying meat. Even, even if you have a zero emotional attachment to a pig and a call it 50% emotional attachment to a deer on a rifle, there's still the process of I killed it, I tracked it, I skinned it, I gutted it, I quartered it, I did all this stuff. Then I brought it home. After I brought it home, uh, we process our own meat for the most part. I butchered it, right? That emotional attachment throughout uh, a week-long process is different than just saying, I'm going to go to the store and pick up a pound of ground beef. Yeah, and, and what's interesting that's almost, I guess it's tangent to this conversation, is the way I view a lot of hog hunting the, is similar to the way I view a lot of like long-range target shooting. It, it, it's not a conversation of, empathy and ethics and, and meaningfulness, but it's, it's tactical operation. <laughs> it's here's opportunity. Here's a way to get it done. Here's how I need to move. Here's how I need to act. I did it. Yeah. I accomplished the mission. That's kind of how I view hog hunting. And maybe that's, maybe I've just straight up read too much Tom Clancy and <laughs> I probably have gray man. Yeah. Um, like, Court Gentry has influenced me way too much. <laughs> but it comes to the point where I view the way I operate tact tactically is a little bit different than this kind of hunting mentality of what it truly means to me. Well, and the difference too is that's a that's a 
uh, uh, invasive species, call it, yeah, called pigs. For me, I view deer hunting very almost, different, almost the same way as if like. I planted a seed yes. and watched it grow, and then I was able to harvest a plant from that seed. And wow, how amazing is that? Yes. Whereas I view hog hunting more as, yeah, I moved into a house and there was this tree in my yard, and then a storm knocked it over, and I chopped that tree up into firewood, <laughs> and I used that firewood to warm my home. Yeah. Look at how I made value out of something that was otherwise invaluable to others. Yes. Well, and it was so funny about you saying that is like, this is probably a conversation that most non-hunters probably wouldn't understand. Dude, we're we're going to get... Like, pe- we're deep here. Pe- people are going to definitely attack us for this, I think. And that's fine. Here's the deal, though. When you talk about deer hunting, there's something about deer. Like, uh, when it's, you look, it's romantic. It's romantic. It, dude, that's the perfect word. And and by the way, if, if the entire United States of America stopped deer hunting tomorrow, guess what would happen? All the deer, they would get disease and they would die. They would have famine... Within five years, they would all be in a really bad shape. So there's a symbiotic relationship between hunters and deer. And what we recognize as hunters is if I, well, not all of us, but I think you and I do. If we go into a property like, like down in Iran and there's five deer there and we kill three of them and we've only seen five the whole year, we kill three of them. Probably not a good thing to do. Yeah. But this year we shot, we saw, 12 to 15 of them and we shot two of them guess what we did we helped thin out the herd which is a good thing the food supply is is going to be beneficial to a 12 person herd or 12 deer herd versus a 15 well it's extremely sustainable it's sustainable we're probably going to see the exact same number of deer this next year maybe one or two more maybe like a slight increase if our um feeding, planning, management strategies work, then we'll see a slight increase. But otherwise, we we have not harmed the environment nor Correct. the ecosystem. We have merely participated in it. And the difference now between that and wild hogs in Texas, if you wild hogs can can reproduce two to three times a year. Each litter they drop is call it eight to fifteen pigs. Do the math on that. You got two to three litters that are dropping a year. Dude, and and I'm totally interrupting you, but one thing that's really interesting is people hear about the hog problem in Texas. There's so many pigs in Texas. And they, they, they hear about that as if it's like the easy opportunity that needs to just like any any Joe can pick up an AR-15 right. and go wipe them out. And I, I think that's very, very untrue. Agreed. I think pigs are smarter than white-tailed deer 100%. From, from my experience. And because the hog problem has just absolutely overrun Texas, specifically in the Southwest, hogs have been in Texas and Florida for a long time, but it, it's gotten to a point where anybody th- who thinks they can buy a double XL ACU pant and, and buy a, you know, Smith and Wesson M and P sport with a $40 BSA red dot optic that they can think that they can go all man, all commando and so- solve the hog problem. We're not going to have it. No, no, we're not there. You you have to be more strategic than that. And, and people view it as this problem of supply and demand that, oh, there's this huge oversupply of hogs. Now we can all just get in there and get it done. When it's they're smart animals, it, dude. dude, they're still smart animals and hunting is still difficult from finding places where you can hunt to once you find those places, how do you hunt them? To what weapons, what timing, what bait, what seasons, what calls, what there's so much to it that it still is very intentional. Whether it is the level three, as you call it, super meaningful spot and stock with a bow, public land, intentional, go out and get it done the hard way hunt, or whether it is the what me and Kyle just did, I'm like, dude. This sow has hit the feeder at five <laughs> o'clock every day. I will meet you there. I will hike in. You just bring your AR and I'll be there. Uh, literally, he got smoke it. He got in the stand with his kid and I snuck up and snuck in the blind with him, set up my camera five minutes later. That sow showed up. Boom. It was done. That's amazing, dude. It, it's it worked out well, but but either way. It's not just this like commando mentality of just like, oh, I have the proper gear and I, I guess I'm going to be part of the solution. Well, it, I think it still isn't very 
intentional. Yeah. And I think people lack the intentionality to get it done. I think the reality is like when you're pig hunting, even if you classify it as level two, right? You're still hunting. Like that's the difference is I think there's a lot of folks that look at it as like, Hey, I can go to the grocery store and get meat. Whereas regardless of if it's level two, level three or level four, where you're farming and it's real emotional or again, emotional scale, you're still, you're still pulling a trigger, releasing a bowstring or whatever you're going to do to kill it. You're still killing something. Yeah. And dude, I haven't even told you this, but I'm probably going to get a lot of shit for it. After you know what I've been up to the last couple of days and the last couple of weeks with whether it's archery or with a two two three or six five or it it, do, it doesn't matter what it what what weapon it is, kind of find a way to get it done. But I discovered that there's a hashtag <laughs> called Pigs of Instagram, and it's mostly people cuddling with their little pink piggly wiggly, and I've been posting to that hashtag. <laughs> And mine are more little hairy, <laughs> long-nosed critters laying in the bag of, bed of a Dodge Ram with oh, dude. a little bit of red stuff coming out of their face. Dude, so I got to tell you the story. So I got a really good buddy of mine. He's in California, uh, San Diego County. Uh, my buddy, Matt Westrick, he's the, he's the man. He's my you really... You just called a dude out by name. Oh, I totally did. Normally, we talk a little bit more abstract no, no, on the I podcast, wanna... but we're getting real, man. No, no, I want this guy... I and want by the him way, to hear I appreciate this. the goldfish. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why some of them are green and purple, dude. I can't figure that out either. It's like the it, I don't understand it. It's like the <laughs> the Noah's Ark of goldfish over here. <clears throat> I don't get it. So anyway, my buddy Matt, uh, great dude, uh, one of my best buddies in the entire world. So he got a little pot belly pig for his daughter. He's got kids my kids' age. My kids are seven, five, and three. Uh, he's got kids, uh, two older kids, uh, six and four ish. Call it right. So he got a pot belly pig for him and uh, he dressed the pig up. Uh, the sa- so when you say dressed a pig, I think you mean it very differently than when I say dressed a pig. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. So, so on, it was a new year's, new year's day kind of deal. And he put on the pig, this little, like, uh, what do you, what do you call those things that girls wear to hold their hair back? Tiara headband, like a headband tiara thing. It said like hairnet. Yeah, it, no, it was like a, <laughs> it was like a a hair holder tiara, call it, and it said on it 2022 or 2021. This is last year, 2021. And he sent it to me and a couple of buddies that we all used to work together. And he's like, look at look at my pig. He said this picture, right? This was literally right after I'd had my first bow kill on a pig, where. We shot that sow that was pregnant. The greaser? The greaser. And we pulled her out of the ditch. And you did a great job with that. Pliny's got photo magic. So it was like pitch dark out. And he's like, hey, I'm going to set this camera to do this. And he shined these lights. And it it turned out great. I'm just like, don't move. Yeah, don't move. (laughs) Long exposure. So so on my buddy Matt's uh, picture, it says, happy, happy New Year's. So I sent a picture. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, this big old fat sow and keep in mind this is a high lung shot so it was like real bubbly real red blood coming out of the top of its lungs and i and i'm gonna get shit for this now right all the all the antis are gonna come after me uh and it said it said happy new year (laughs) and i sent it back i said hey pig for pig here we go (laughs) dude and that's one of those things that it just comes down to like what's your base level of understanding if it's like yeah, pigs are this cute little fuzzy animal. <laughs> what was it? Was it Moby that we were talking about who had a whole bunch of stuff? I, yes. used, to, I used to listen to his music and then it's all this like pig rescue stuff. It, it just comes down to like, what's your understanding and and what does it mean to you? Like ultimately, if you don't eat meat, like I get where you can you can be mad at this. If you eat meat, like bro, come on. Like, you eat meat. Like, do you know how those animals are killed that you're picking up off the grocery shelf? If you don't, then you probably shouldn't talk much. If you're a hardcore vegan, I, I, I'd probably... I respect that. I'd probably like to talk to you on a podcast someday because you probably have a really, like, the same level of stubbornness that I have, honestly. But most people aren't that. Right. Most people are kind of like wobbling in the mediocrity of 
I don't understand the extremes of either end, but you know, it sure is nice to have meat to put in my mouth. And it's great that I'm going to go to, you know, a restaurant tonight to eat a burger level one style. And that I don't have to really worry about what happened to that animal, but I still get to enjoy it. Or think about the fact that like that animal was raised in captivity. There was a spike put through its face. That animal died. It was butchered and turned into ground beef mixed with a bunch of fat and sent out to Kroger. Like that's the reality of it, right? Whereas when I kill an animal, whether it's level two or level three with a, with a, you know, emotional detachment or not, I know, ex- like I have in my freezer tonight and, and I pulled this out for plenty earlier uh, tomorrow for lunch, I'm going to eat a Neil guy steak. Guess what? I know exactly where that Neil guy came from. And yeah. guess what? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that Neil guy grew up in that place. I shot him, killed him. I butchered him or I quartered him with plenty in the field. Then I brought him back, butchered him. And the meat sitting in my, my cooler right now, or my fridge right now is an actual cut from that animal that I took. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt from field to table where that meat came from. And and even a post that I just put on Instagram, it was a bloody arrow and it said, my preferred way to shop for breakfast sausage. And (laughs) and to me, that's very real. And a lot of people think that's crude. That's crass. They, they, they look at all the details of the ethics there, but Ultimately, there is huge opportunity for shooting pigs in Texas, and I went out and got it done, and I am I am more connected to the food that I eat through it. And maybe I'm just bolstering myself in saying that, but I, but I think there's a lot of value in truly having a connection and an understanding to the food that I, that I eat. And what I would say for everyone out there, whether you're uh, uh, anti or pro or in the middle— Dude, come join us. Like, seriously, hit hit us up in the comments. Say, hey, I don't necessarily agree with you, or maybe I do agree with you, or maybe I don't know, but I want to figure it out. Come join us and and under like there's a I never knew this until I got into hunting. There's a different emotional mentality that starts to happen to you as you start hunting. And and until you do it, like I trust me, I understand the mentality before that of like man, you're killing thing, you're killing things and, and you're, you I, I don't understand that because I don't, I don't deal with it every day. I'm going to great, like, I, I get it. Right. Come do it. Come with us, join us and see what it's about. And then suddenly I think your mindset's going to be like, you know what? I would rather, I would rather eat meat that I know where it's sourced from than eat meat that's, it could come from a thousand different factories, and I, I have no idea how that animal was treated. There's no emotional attachment to that animal that I'm eating versus I know 70 plus percent of the meat that I eat, I absolutely understand the emotional attachment of that animal. And in some degree, it's it's no different than than women who are very interested in, in fashion and su- sustainability and they, they want to, instead of just supporting major brands built in Asia in huge factories, they want to buy fabric from a local shop and sew their own clothes, or they want to cook meals in their own home. It's the same mentality of people who just want to understand exactly where something came from and make it more meaningful, more personal, just like a home garden. You, you see it grow, you understand the whole process, and it feeds your family directly instead of being disconnected from something. It's it's just like any DIY anything. It really is. It becomes more meaningful when you do it yourself. And I will say, like, it's so cool as a father with young children to get them involved in this and to get them. They don't think about meat the same way growing up that I thought about meat. Hmm. They really don't. They... Every time we eat meat, they ask me, Daddy, did you kill this? And in a way, that probably strokes your ego a little bit. And it's, sure. And it's kind of cool sure. that you're like, my children see me as this provider and sure. this alpha. But also on a more 100%. Just open level, you're like... They, I'm they getting st- them to think about meat consumption differently. Yeah, in terms of just like truly like, where does it even come from? Right. Like they're asking the question. 100%. And that's... So it, you're right. It it totally uh, there's the, there's the aspect of it that strokes the ego, 
But more than that, it's my kids, especially Elijah, my oldest now, who's been hunting with me and seen me shoot a deer and then help me skin it and butcher it, goes, hey, dad, are we eating the deer that I killed? He obviously, right? He, he didn't, but he's part of it. I was with you when it was killed. He, he's with it. <laughs> yeah. But he's with it, right? He helped me do it. And so his thought process is, dad, is this the deer we killed together? As a, as a dad with a boy, honestly, there is nothing in life I would want more than that. Like, seriously, there is, you could, you could give me a hundred million dollars and it wouldn't replace that interaction with my son. Dude, that's cool. And as somebody who doesn't have kids, I, I admit that I'm I'm a little bit jealous of that. But I still understand like how impactful that can be and how meaningful that can be. The idea that you went out it, again, it comes back to intentionality that you sourced it yourself. Um, dude, I was on a river trip with a bunch of buddies, and I killed a snake with a paddle. And I, and it is one, probably one of the most redneck moments of my entire life, but I cooked and ate that snake and therefore it had meaning because no, I didn't rely on some That's level five stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, it's like kind of a weird little separate track. It's like a level 3.5. Yeah. It's, it's like, a, it's like a level, I don't know, G like yeah, it's, yeah. it's not even on the same yeah. language. But just the idea that instead of owing somebody else for what you use to sustain yourself and feed yourself, you went and got it done and you just made it work. And you know what? It it comes down to appreciating creation. Yes. And and we know that as Christians in this world, we are going to toil, that it's going to be hard, that it's going to be tough, but we can kind of embrace that toughness and struggle and still, I guess, see the value of nature and beauty and, and still find a way to succeed and enjoy it. That's pretty cool. It is really cool. Because to me, one of the things, so I, I went to art school, Daniel's kind of this finance business guy. And so he looks at me like art, whatever, (laughs) Artsy fartsy. but on, on the door of the art school that I went to, it just said in the beginning, God created and there was no point other than that. It was just that that creation itself is powerful. And the fact that we as created beings can inter- interact with other creative beings in a way that's really meaningful, that's super cool. Super and in- cool. instead of outsourcing that to others, to have that responsibility and that respect, uh, I really enjoy and appreciate that. And yeah, sometimes it comes down to making kills and and talking about ethics and where I'm trying really, really hard to obey the ethics that I've established. And sometimes I'm compromising them. Only on pigs though. (laughs) Mostly on pigs, (laughs) but still we're in the situation where we get to enjoy creation. And that's, what's so cool about it to me. Well, so not to go too theological on you, right? But no, please, please do. In the, in the beginning of time, if, if you're a Christian You'll understand this. When God created the heavens and the earth, he said he created man to have dominion over, right? And that doesn't mean to abuse, to rape and pillage, to harm. It, that's not what it means. But he said you have, you have dominion over the animals that walk on the land, that creep on the earth, and the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, right? And again, where I come back to with that is it's not to harm and, and pillage. It's not the idea of a conqueror, but, Correct. but the idea of somebody who can enjoy something, but also has some responsibility. Correct. We have responsibility over it. Right. And the way that I look at it is again, it goes back to management, right? Uh, we talked about this a little earlier. So a, a deer population in the United States of America, if you let it run rampant, in the United States that it is today, that that herd would be overpopulated, lack of food, disease, all these kinds of things, right? <clears throat> There's a reason that the wildlife associations <clears throat> exist today. It's to, to protect the herd and to allow uh, 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 humans to enjoy game, 
right? I think that's a much more natural thing than saying, hey, we're going to create a salmon farm. And in that salmon farm, we're going to farm fish and all those fish will die. And or we're going to create a, and this isn't a knock on fisheries or farms. Like we have to feed people, right? But for me personally, I mean, even to that point, like, if fertilizer didn't exist, if synthetic fertilizer didn't Correct. exist, most of the world would not eat. Correct. Like that's just straight up a fact. Correct. And 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 so we kind of have to accept that as a base level, but then from that base level, how can we how can we look for methods that are maybe a little bit more sustainable but also more meaningful? Right. Like, like we have to acknowledge that some of it is for us. That it's not this like exterior conversation of sustainability or ethics that some of it is for just like internal meaningfulness. Right. We were given dominion over again, the, the, the animals on land. And that's, again, that's not to like murder, destroy and kill. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's if everyone in the, in the world was a vegan and this isn't a knock on vegans, but if everyone was a vegan, none of us would survive. Have you seen the movie? Soylent green. Uh, uh-uh. uh, it's this like future post-apocalyptic world where there was no more food sources. And so everybody had to sustain on this synthetic plankton based food. It sounds awful. That they called Soylent Red. And then they realized the world was running out of Soylent Red. And so there was this new solution called Soylent Green. And the whole conclusion at the end is Soylent Green. One of the guy's friends dies and they follow his corpse to where it's taken to this factory. Oh, this is the one you keep telling. Soylent Green is people. That's the whole conclusion. But I know that's that's drama, that's fiction. But it's the whole, true. But the whole idea is instead of this embracing synthetics, embracing like what's most anom- like economical. What what can we use to 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 make things kind of generally work in the most sustainable, neutral way? Let's look at a way that's sustainable, but also empowering and and more related to how we are created and how we can interact with the natural world as it was created. And I would say that out of the 330 million Americans in the United States of America, uh, there there's there, the likelihood that 90% of them will go hunt is very low, right? The likelihood that 10% will go hunt, 20% will go hunt. It's very low. But yeah, here, I would say the likelihood that ten percent is going to hunt. You're probably is right. Pretty high. You're probably right. Um, but the likelihood that half of America will hunt is low. Agreed. So here is my final word on just the emotional status of level one, two, and three. You don't have to hunt to appreciate the fact that hunters exist. And what I mean by that is, as the 330 million Americans walking this, this country recognizes the vast majority of us eat meat and the vast majority of us eat meat without an emotional attachment, myself included, right? For a long time. And even when I go to restaurants, when I eat a hamburger, there's zero emotional attachment, zero, right? But the reality is having an appreciation for the whole concept of an emotional attachment to an animal. I would love for 330 million Americans or in this, again, it's not a knock on vegans, but take vegans out because they don't eat meat. It's called 310 million. I don't know how many there are 300 million Americans that eat meat. My, what I would implore every American that eat meats to think about is there is an emotional attachment. Whether you recognize it or not. Like, are you hiding from it or are you acknowledging it? Correct. There's, there's an animal, and this goes back to the Bible. There was an animal that sacrificed its life for you to have sustenance. That's a real thing. And even when I'm pretty casual and laissez-faire about shooting a pig in the freaking face... I'm still acknowledging what I've done and that I'm responsible for it and that I need to quickly find that animal, take care of that animal, butcher that animal, process that animal, put it on ice, take care of it and get it processed. Like, uh, even when it appears incredibly casual, there's still a lot of responsibility that comes Correct. from that. That's, it's I would missed. say, even more. Like, when people give me flack about that, it's still more than just like, 
I oh. went to the grocery store oh. and picked up some meat. Pork's three ninety nine a pound. Yeah, and and that's not that's not to say that you shouldn't go to the grocery store and get pork for three ninety nine a pound. It's to say recognize the pork that you're eating or the beef that you're eating was an actual living animal that was killed. You didn't have to do it. So there's an emotional detachment there, but there was an actual living thing that died for you to eat that. Yeah. That that's what, that would be my parting thought. Yeah. And I mean, it just comes down to respect. Have respect for it. Respect for what we're doing, and again, there are some times where we're we're high fiving and we're super enthusiastic, but a lot of times it's because of the struggle. It's and not the, the kill. It, it's it's the team that yeah they struggled through the whole game and they won, and so they all rush the field at the end. Right. It's it's that mentality. It's not because of a lack of of respect. It's it's because we're excited because we've finally succeeded we finally accomplished the goals sometimes in exactly the way we intended sometimes not quite so much but guess what we, we've still managed to look at what's out there find a way to take it and make it meaningful turn it into meat that we can eat bring home to families and, and i think that's super cool and i would say last thought is that uh that process of being engaged in it the whole time, struggling and finally, whether you finally get it or not, right? Just the whole process of being out there and engaged in the in, in natural life of trying to find and hunt something is much more meaningful. And the excitements, the highs of it, of high-fiving and being like, man, this is amazing, um, is much more meaningful than we finished the soccer game. We all went to the burger joint. And we all high five because of the soccer game. Yeah. And guess what? Soccer's still there tomorrow. Soccer's still there tomorrow. The burger joint's still there tomorrow. Yet all the Nothing meat, really changed. Yeah. All the meat that was eaten in both of those situations, emotionally, totally different. Yeah. We paid no respect to. None. Yeah. Whereas, whereas even if we high five and we get flack for this because they're like, oh, you guys are assholes for high fiving or shooting a pig in the face. Well, guess what? We understand where that pig came from. We hunted that pig. We were there with that pig. We invested emotionally. We invested time-wise. We invested in that pig. You go to a grocery store, you go to a restaurant, you eat a, you eat a burger, and you high-five your friends about soccer. Just remember, that animal died as well. Yeah, and, and you didn't even acknowledge it. Didn't even acknowledge it. So I guess that all comes down to, man, we, we've been all over this all over the place. And I think Daniel and I would both acknowledge that neither one of us are extreme long range shooters. We generally, I I, I think know what we're doing, but we're not experts at it. We're not extreme bow hunters. We generally know what we're doing, but we're not experts at it. We're not extreme pistol hunter, pistol, well, hunters, hunters, shooters, tacticians, whatever. Um, But we're not expert at uh, experts at it. It all comes down to balance for us. And the reason we're involved in all this stuff is because the general theme is progress in a direction that's meaningful and that's important. Whether it's pistol shooting, rifle shooting, archery shooting. When Daniel talked about levels one, two, and three, that's not to say level three is absolutely pure and and good and the best and that you should never engage in level one. It's just to acknowledge that all this stuff is valuable and that the more we can fall into this and and appreciate what we're doing and participate in what we're doing, man, that, that is super cool and super valuable. hundred percent emotionally understand like and emotionally, we don't mean it as in crying and what we mean by emotional is you have an emotional attachment to the food that powers and sustains your body meaningfulness meaning that's a great word for it meaningfulness and that's what it all comes down to is whether it is level one two or three there's meaning and when you go to the grocery store and buy meat there's meaning in it maybe it's just to get together with your buddies and you want to do it quick and that's there's nothing wrong with that i do that every freaking weekend there's meaningfulness to i want to go out and get something done with my kid and i the only way i can do it is with a rifle or i want to go get something done and bring meat home to my family and then there's meaningfulness to, man, I want to I sweat 
I want to bleed. You're going to let old Plenty talk you into getting a bunch of trigger bites and doing it the hard yes. way and riding your bicycle and shooting arrows. Because all of a sudden, <laughs> dude, all of a sudden I have this animal hanging on my wall that everyone would be like, what the hell is that thing? I'm like, dude, not only is that thing amazing, I bow hunted that on public land with with no guide, no any. And it's it's more emotionally meaningful to me every time I take a bite of that animal than any other animal I've ever killed in my life. Yeah. Or eaten in my life. Yeah. And I, I just remember even a couple of days ago, like when you picked up that thing and sent me the pictures, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It's so cool to see the mount on the wall. And in fact, you shared some of that meat with me and I'm like, I'm, dude, I'm eating some of him tonight. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even as like a disconnected third party, uh, somewhat disconnected. No, you weren't disconnected. I, I did pack out you two of those quarters on my back. Yeah, yeah. You helped me butcher it and we did two pack outs on it. <laughs> but I did not shoot this animal. I did not kill this animal. But still seeing the appreciation of the mount on the wall and the meat in my freezer, it, it's it's beautiful and amazing in its own special kind of way. 100% agree. So we've gone all over the place in this podcast talking about bow hunting, rifle hunting, ethics. Uh, <laughs> we've rambled on for quite a while. My dog's eating goldfish. So that's in there. <laughs> We're eating goldfish. The dog's eating goldfish. It's a party. But I hope you found this enjoyable. Hopefully it's meaningful to you. Until next time, stay safe, be free, and never stop seeking adventure.